This morning, uh, we want to look at John chapter 20. So if you'll open your Bible to John chapter 20. Famous account after uh, the resurrection. Jesus came to his disciples and appeared to them uh, on the first Easter. Verse 19 says that the same day at the evening, the day that he rose from the dead, it being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, the disciples were not necessarily naturally bold. They'd seen Jesus killed. They'd heard the report from the women that they had uh, seen him. Peter and John ran to the tomb. They saw the tomb empty. They saw the grave clothes lying there where he had been laid. They saw the cloth that had covered his head folded up in its place. He wasn't there. They came back. They weren't sure what to to make of all of it. And so uh, there they were huddled together, this uh, small, small group of discouraged and confused disciples. And it says at the end of verse 19, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they're retained. That is, they will be the messengers that will communicate uh, his uh, words to the people. So it's not as though they have the power to forgive sin. It's that they're the ones who will establish the foundation and the basis for forgiveness. If you're here today at church and you need to be forgiven, we have good news for you. You can be forgiven, no matter what you did. You can have all that shame and guilt taken away. There's a means by which you can be forgiven, and that means has been established by Jesus. He did the work. You can receive forgiveness by asking for forgiveness. You can ask Jesus to forgive you, and he'll forgive you. So uh, if you reject that and you say, well, I don't know, I think I'll try it on my own, well, then you won't be forgiven. That's not any human being's decision. That's the means that God's provided for salvation. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So you get to make the choice. Do you want to receive the forgiveness through Jesus or not? So then we are introduced to Thomas, because apparently when they were all together at the first Easter service, Thomas didn't come to church on Easter. Can you imagine someone not even coming on Easter? I just say that for the benefit of you guys that are here. We're glad you're here. But Thomas didn't even come to church on Easter. They were all gathered. They'd heard the report. For whatever reason, Thomas wasn't with them. Verse 24 tells us that. Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And then verse 25, the other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. And so he said to them, unless I see his hands and the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's interesting that he says that. Uh, When Jesus had said back in verse 20, uh, it says, uh, he said, peace to you. And then when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So it probable that when they were relating the story that Jesus was alive, they said, we, we looked, and there it was, you know, it was him. How did you know it was him? Well, there, we saw the holes. We saw where he'd been pierced. We saw the hole in his eye. It was Jesus. And so it would seem that their reporting of what they'd seen, now he takes that part of the report and says, well, unless I see for myself, unless I can see those very holes myself and put my finger right there, if I can put my hand in his side, uh, then um, I'm not going to believe. And then verse 26, he, he came to church again after Easter. So Thomas might have missed Easter, but he came the next week. So we're hoping that that will be true for you also. We're glad that you're here. He was there eight days later. The disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, and the doors were shut. And again, he stood in their midst and said, Peace to you. It's interesting that the greeting that Jesus gives is a greeting of peace. This would be the common greeting, but so significant in this moment, having died on the cross and risen from the dead, and the message from heaven to man is peace. Now, man's message to God has been what? War. I don't want to do what you say. I don't want you in my life. You can't dictate to me what to do. I'll 
sleep where I want to sleep. I'll eat what I want to eat. I'll drink what I want to drink. I'll go where I want to go. Man's message to God, earth to heaven, has been, what do you want? God's message back to earth has been peace. I want to make peace with you. That's what I want. I want peace with you. Then, though, Thomas, this this part of the account is focused on him. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Father, we thank you for uh, the promised blessing for those who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas was close to receiving that blessing, so close, and yet he missed out on it. He didn't believe the testimony of those who had seen the risen Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that there's a blessing for those who have never seen and yet have believed. And we thank you, Lord, that we can receive that blessing. We pray that we would. We pray that every person listening this morning would know the blessing of faith without sight, would know the blessing of believing in the Word of God, believing in the promises of God, believing in the truth of what God has said, the promises that were made by your mouth, Lord, through your servants, your prophets, through many ages, through many years. Lord, the things that you've promised your children, and they've all come true, not one word of what you've promised has failed. And we thank you for the blessing for those who believe, who've never seen. We pray you'd encourage us this morning about faith and the resurrection and about believing in you and believing in what you said. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, you've seen, and so you believe. How blessed are those who have never seen and yet have believed. We live in a skeptical generation. I think human beings have always been skeptical, and I think there's a reason why. It's because there's many deceivers. People will sell you a car that's a piece of junk, telling you that it's really good. So you need to bring your mechanic and check it out. You need to bring your friend who knows about cars and look at it and listen to it and go, I think I hear a valve knocking. Oh, no, no, that just makes that noise. It's kind of a, you know, it's a high-tech engine. You know, people will lie to you. Um, you know, the old uh, saying by, the, by that circus guy, you know, there's a sucker born every minute. And that's a great philosophy of life. His business model was built around the idea of there's some idiot out there and I can take his money. So, he, so the, the concept of, of, the, of the need to be skeptical comes from our interaction with each other. It doesn't come from our interaction with God. God hasn't taught us to be skeptical. There's nothing in what God has ever done for a person or what God's ever said to a person that would make you skeptical. The reason you become skeptical is because you went to kindergarten. I mean, if you were idealistic, maybe you had the perfect home and perfect siblings and great parents, kindergarten will cure you of your idealism about humanity. I remember being introduced to a game called Dogpile. Do you remember Dogpile? And the biggest, fastest kid in our kindergarten, who will go unnamed, I still carry some deep-seated bitterness, <laughs> his name was Jeff, and I won't say his last name, but I do remember it. And that kid, he, he would just be, we'd be on the playground, and he would just yell, dog pile on, and he'd just pick somebody, some poor person, and he'd say their name, and you were just glad it wasn't your name. So all the kid, kindergartners were just... The poor person, you just get creamed. And you're like, well, at least it ain't me at the bottom of this mess. And then, you know, you'd all get up, and then the next person gets their name called. And this, and, you know, that's just a great introduction to sociological forces that are at work, you know, and group <laughs> dynamics. The reason we become skeptical is because of each other. A uh, wife becomes skeptical about relationships because of her husband. A husband becomes skeptical about relationships. Someone becomes disillusioned about marriage because of their spouse's behavior, not because of what God said. People become skeptical about church because of the way a minister acted. People become skeptical about having a faith in God because of what church leaders have done. 
They were in a class and the person acted in a way that misrepresented God and they think, well, I'm not sure. Our skepticism comes from our interactions with each other. We produce our own skepticism. So if you're here and you're a skeptic, congratulations, you've figured the rest of us out. It's wise to be skeptical. We have to be careful about our skepticism. Skeptics many times, when it comes to a relationship with God or knowing about God, they create obstacles that don't really exist. I read a really great quote by the famous preacher from London from a century ago, Charles Spurgeon, about skepticism. And I'm just going to read it to you. He says, Well, now, beloved friends, let us hear our Lord saying to us, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And let us come to this point, that we know what we do know, and it is divinely fixed in our soul that it is so. And therefore, if an objection is raised against what we believe, we feel certain that it needs to be answered. He's talking about the believer's response to skepticism. We feel this need that this objection needs to be answered. He goes on to say, it may not always be our duty to answer it. We may not have the special knowledge that's necessary for the task. We have a proverb which says, fools set stones for wise men to tumble over. And any fool could throw a stone into a well, which a very wise man could not get out again. And nowadays it seems to be the business of a great many learned fools to find difficulties for wise men to answer. I think things haven't changed very much in 100 years. We have something else to do besides answering them. That's great wisdom there. If you try to satisfy every man who starts a new theory, you will have nothing to do but answer objections. He was encouraging the believers in his fellowship to, to not be chasing after every perceived objection that a person might have. You, you may not be knowledgeable enough in astronomy or in geology. You may not be knowledgeable enough in uh, you know, some special field where the person has challenged and raised this objection. Many times skeptics are creating a straw man. You remember that phrase that's used of someone presenting an argument? They've made, their own, they've made their own presentation of the reality, the premise, the argument, and only for the purpose of burning it up. It's some, you know, this is what you guys think, and this is what it is, and then they burn it up. And they go, see, look, you're a fool. There, there are many, many objections. The objections are not coming out of an honest inquiry into truth. The objections are coming out of a heart that says, I really don't want to have anything to do with God. And on that basis, well, all kinds of objections are constructed. You need to ask yourself the question when there's skepticism, who's asking? <laughs> who's asking this objection? And a second question, what will you accept as proof? Before I want to take some time and, and energy and invest into trying to answer someone's objection, is this an honest question? Are you truly actually wanting to hear an answer? And if I give you an answer, will you accept it? What is the criterion for the evidence that you'll, you'll accept? Many people, and I've talked to them, and you have as well, you give them an answer, and it was a really good answer. And they go, well, well I don't know about that. Well, I thought, we, I thought we were having an honest conversation. I thought you were asking me an honest question and that you were going to accept an honest answer that was valid. Yeah, well, I don't know. You guys all say, I don't know about that stuff. Well, so all of a sudden you don't know about it, but a minute ago you were an expert. It's interesting. That's, that's dishonest, isn't it? Who's asking the question and what will they accept as, as uh, evidence? It's very important. Now, we're talking not about the average skeptic. We're talking about one of the disciples who has skepticism. We're actually looking at a case study. We have an individual here that we can consider who's asking this question. Well, unless I see the holes for myself, I'm not going to be believing. We're asking about Thomas. Thomas would not believe the testimony of his closest friends. Isn't that amazing? I remember the first time I heard the gospel, it was from a close friend. We had been friends since we were little boys. We were now 15 years old. He gave his life to Jesus. He was very thoughtful. He was a very... A clear thinker. He was a very, very smart guy, and he'd given his life to Christ, and he wanted to tell his friend, Rich, about the gospel, and I was an atheist like he had been an atheist, and he had kind of had sought out a lot of answers. He had a lot of evidence, and we started to have these debates, and I was just, I was very skeptical, but I was also not really very open, and I was really not very honest, 
The answer to the question of who's asking the questions and what will they accept as evidence, I was asking the questions, I wouldn't accept anything as evidence. Okay? I was sinning and having a lot of fun sinning. I didn't have any interest in somebody telling me what, they were gonna, what my life should be. I wanted to do whatever I wanted, however I wanted, and nobody had enough evidence to convince me that was not a good idea. <laughs> so he tried to share with me. I, I rejected the gospel. I blasphemed. I, I, I hardened my heart. And, uh, and I look back at that, and I think, this, this is one of my closest friends. God had done a work in his life. He'd come to faith, and, and he's trying to share with his friend. And I didn't accept the testimony of one of my closest friends. So I can relate to Thomas. And then two years later, another close friend gave his life to Jesus, and he came with testimony again. But in that two years, I'd done a lot of sinning, and the consequences of sin and the reality of a life of sin started to become apparent to me, and I started thinking, you know what? This whole world's just a mess. <laughs> you know, if I just keep going down this road, it's a road that's going to lead to death. And, and I, was, I was more open. And my friend gave me testimony of what God had done, of the risen Christ, of the power of Jesus, of the power of the Word of God, and I saw it in his life, and I opened my heart, and I accepted the Lord. So I'm like Thomas in one context where I didn't believe the testimony of a friend, but thank God I had other friends, and my other friend had accepted the Lord, and he came and told me about Jesus. And so I was able to be like Thomas and also not be like Thomas. He wouldn't believe the testimony of his closest friends. So we could ask the question, why? Why didn't he believe? And we can only guess. And I have a lot of commentaries in my library, and probably as many commentaries as I have, and I read several of them, a bunch of them this week. Um, uh, about as many commentaries as I have, or as many authors as they are, they have a different opinion. So we're in an area of conjecture or speculation. So um, you may come up with a different idea. What would, what would you guess about why Thomas needed to see. Maybe he looked at these other disciples and he knew what they were really all about and thought, well, you guys are gullible and you know, like whatever. He knew their weaknesses. He knew them. And so he thought, well, if it's you, I don't really believe. Well aware of their weaknesses. Could be he was a self-reliant person who wanted to see for himself unless I see for myself. Um, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to just go off what you guys say. Maybe he wanted to have the same experience that they had. Maybe as they're, they're telling the tale, hey, we saw it. We saw his hands. We saw the hole in his side. And maybe he's thinking, well, I want the same experience. You had some specific thing happen for you. I want the exact same thing to happen for me. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was too hard for him to believe in something that impossible. Maybe he just thought these guys were high. You know, maybe they had a fire and there was a, they, cooked, they put some wood on there and they just tripped. I don't, I mean, people don't rise from the dead. It's impossible. Maybe he just, he just couldn't believe in something that would be supernatural. Maybe it was something like that. Who knows? Maybe you'll have a different idea. Who knows why? We're not given the detail of why he didn't believe, but we are given some details. We can answer the two questions. Who's asking the questions or who has the objection? Who's the doubter? And what will they accept as evidence? We have the answer to both of those in our case study. Who's the person doubting? This is a person who knows a lot about Jesus. This doubter has actually seen the Lord work many, many times. He knows about the synagogue ruler from Capernaum whose child was raised from the dead. He was with them on the road when they were going by the little village of Nain and there was a funeral procession coming out and he saw Jesus raise that guy from the dead. He was there when Lazarus was called out of the tomb and Lazarus was raised from the dead. He'd seen people raised from the dead. He'd seen the evidence. So this is a person, you look and you think, well, I'm not not really sure what's the root of your doubt, bro. (laughs) Why is it so hard for you, of all people, to grasp that God could do something beyond what you could imagine, that God would have power over the grave. You've actually seen Jesus demonstrate his power over the grave. You've watched Jesus raise people from the dead. This is a person who's who's hung on every word of Jesus. He's listened to the teaching of Christ for three years. This is not a person that you would traditionally think as a skeptic. This is a person who knows the word of God. But I would venture to say in this audience, there are some people who actually know what Jesus says. They actually have seen God work genuine works, 
And yet still they're struggling with that surrender. Still maybe one foot in the world, one foot in the Lord. Still wavering and faltering between two opinions. Hey, if Jesus is God, serve him. If alcohol is God, then be a drunk. Make up your mind. If Jesus is God, serve him. If, if weed is God, then get high every day. Make a decision. Choose one God or the other. But don't do both and say that you're one and this. How long are you going to falter between two opinions? You need to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Thomas, considering who he is, well, now we start to think of his doubt maybe a little differently. What is it, Thomas, about this resurrection? Maybe it's his sorrow. I mean, I have a lot of empathy for the guy. He watched Jesus die. He knows Jesus. He saw it and they took him away. He's dead. He went into the grave. Maybe he's too sad. I don't know. We know, though, also what he will accept as evidence. He says it for himself, right out of his own mouth. Verse 25, if you look at it again, unless I see his hands, in his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. So there's your evidence that he needs. I want to see his hands for myself. I want to take my finger and stick it in the hole where the nail was. That's a pretty radical thing to say. I want to take my hand and put it into the hole in the side of Jesus. That is a pretty radical thing to say. But at least he was honest. At least he specified what he, what's required. Maybe we have a skeptic here. What, what, what do you require? Would you say the same thing as Thomas? You say, I'd like to see that hand. I'd like to see that hand. I'd like to put my finger in the, in the hole of the hand. Careful what you ask for. Think of, think of how graphic that is, how powerful. Think of this man who knew Jesus. If you knew Jesus and you were his, one of his closest friends and he died, would you say, hey, I'd like to put my hand in the hole in his side? I pretty much don't think I'd want to do that. Now, we also know Thomas doesn't really want to do that. Because <laughs> when Jesus appears to him and Jesus says, reach your finger here and look, into my, look at my hands, Reach your hand here, put it into my side. Don't be believing but unbelieving. Look at verse 28. There's no mention of him putting his hand in his side or putting his finger in the holes. He just says, my Lord and my God. <laughs> he, he decides he's a believer real quick. There was no, in the moment, there was no interest in saying, well, well let me go ahead and see if I, how far my hand, how far did that, that sword go up? Blood and water came out. Can my hand go all the way up into where your heart is? Think, think of the things that Thomas has asked. I would suggest maybe they're a little bit disrespectful. He doesn't seem really interested in carrying them out once it happens. He seems actually humbled. My Lord and my God. He wasn't really saying that earlier. But I want you to think about this. This is also from Spurgeon, and I, I'm just going to paraphrase. Spurgeon said this in that same sermon that I quoted from. He said, if, if Jesus con condes Jesus condes condescension. Jesus lowering himself. Jesus coming down and meeting Thomas right where he's at. The disrespect of the request to put his hand in his side. Really? You really want to do that to Jesus? But then Spurgeon said this, if Jesus will let a spear go into his side, do you think he'll let the hand of one of his disciples go into his side? Oh, Spurgeon. If Jesus let them take nails and pierce his hands, do you think he'd let the finger of one of, his, one of his best friends touch that wound? I, I think so. If Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, do you think he would condescend to this guy's level and say, here's my hands if you would like. Here's the hole in my side if you'd like. No, I don't think I need to. <laughs> my Lord and my God. He quickly humbles himself. And he's rebuked. Jesus says to him, don't be unbelieving. Don't be an unbeliever but be a believer. Don't be unbelieving. Thomas, there's no reason for your unbelief. There's no reason for it. There was no reason for Thomas's unbelief a week earlier. He had seen and he had heard plenty. He was in the boat when Jesus came walking on the water. He was in the boat when the boat was about to be sunk and Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat and they woke him up and he, Jesus stood up and calmed the sea 
And they said, who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. He was there on that day. He saw that with his own eyes. There, there was no reason a week earlier for his unbelief. God has proven everything that he ever said, that he will keep his promises. There's not a generation that's ever been able to say God made promises to us and he didn't keep them. There's no group that's ever said God promised me this and God couldn't keep his promise. God has kept every single promise. Now, God may not have done everything we wanted him to do the way he wanted the way we wanted him to do it, God may not, in fact, God doesn't jump through our hoops. God's not, you're not going to be able to put him to the test in a sense where you're tempting God. He's not going to respond like that. But every generation gives that same testimony that's given about in the days of Joshua. Not one good word failed of all that God promised us. God keeps his word. The disciples, the eleven who are going to be sent out into the world, they're all believers, but they believed and they saw the evidence. They saw with their own eyes. And they're going to go out and preach to people, and all of their converts are going to believe in the Word of God. Think about the humility that Thomas would have as he would travel around and preach to people, and there's a skeptic saying, well, I'm not sure. And Thomas like, yeah, I get it, bro. <laughs> I, totally, I get your skepticism. I mean, here's a guy, talk about somebody, if Jesus condescended to him, think about him as an apostle, apostle preaching. This guy could be very gentle, I'm sure. Someone says, well, I don't know, I'm just going to, yeah, I know, I get it, I get that. But you need to believe the word of God. You need to believe what God said. Not one good word failed anyone ever. In my life, I've been walking with the Lord for 34 years. Not one promise of God has ever failed in my life. And I've gone through deep water, I've, I've been in the middle of tragedy, I've had things happen that I wish never happened, I've done dumb things that sabotaged my own life, i got all the drama of a normal human life, and I can honestly say, as God is my witness, there's not a promise that God ever said that he ever made to me in his word that has not been completely true to the letter, beyond what I thought it could have happened. God didn't always do what I thought he would do when I wished he would have done it, but he always kept his promise. And I don't have any doubt that to my grave that, will, that God will never fail. Every single thing God said, you can count on it. Now, now, there's reasons why we would believe in something that we can't see. Well, you can put it to the test. I mean, what will you accept as evidence? Really is the question. Well, it has to be repeatable. It has to be provable. You have to be able to demonstrate it. Uh, we, we all, there are many of you guys that are, have done research as part of your education. Well, what, is, what, are, the, what are the parameters? How do you, how, why, why do they have scientific publications where they publish someone's research? Why do we take that as valid? I didn't see that experiment. Well, it was under these conditions. It specified. These people signed off on it. This is what happened. This was the result. And it matches these other results. Listen. Find out about God for yourself. Get into his word. Find out what he says. Believe in him. See what he does in your life. Ask him. Pray. Ask him to work. Ask him to reveal himself. See if he answers your prayer. And watch him answer your prayer. It'll blow your mind. Now, you say, all right, Ferrari. That's it. It's Easter. The Ferrari, I, I don't even care what color. It could be like an Easter color. Pink, green, whatever. Just give me the Ferrari. I can tell you right now the answer is no. God's not mocked. God's not going to jump through somebody's hoops. But if you've got a relationship problem, if there's brokenness in your life, if you're having trouble getting over anger, an anger problem, if you've got an addiction, if you're, if you're being led astray, if, if you want humility, if you want patience, I guarantee you if you pray for those things, you'll get them. Oh, God will be working. He'll answer your prayer. He'll absolutely answer your prayer. Not one good word of God has ever failed anyone ever. And Jesus, in this context, pronounces a blessing on those who have not seen. After Thomas makes this great confession, my Lord and my God, Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. As though that's a, that's a step down. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet believe. Thomas, you are this close to being the first person to believe because of somebody's testimony. Every single believer in this room believed 
without seeing. Every single person who's a believer in this room believed based upon someone's testimony of who Jesus was. You heard it, the Spirit of God was speaking to you, and you became a believer. You asked Jesus to forgive you and come into your heart. You became born again. You believed and you never saw. Thomas had the chance, he was this close, to be in the first one of our group. They're in their own unique group. They're the apostles. They saw, they were witnesses, eyewitnesses of his resurrection. They, he appeared to them over 40 days with many infallible proofs. They weren't the only ones. There were hundreds of others who saw the Lord. He appeared to over uh, 400 people at one time, uh, 500 people. Uh, he demonstrated that he was alive from the dead. But Thomas was this close to being in that group that heard testimony and believed. Jesus pronounces this as a beatitude. He said, blessed are those who've not seen and yet believed. Think of the beatitudes that Jesus has given us. We have this one. We have blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. You know the beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be filled. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called the, the sons of God. Here's a, here's a blessing, a beatitude, coined by Jesus. It's a truth, stated in this real simple way. Here's a blessing for you. You want to be blessed? How happy. The word blessed means happy. It's not a, it's not a religious sanctification. It's not like you get your own halo or you, you glow or you, know, you turn into some... Uh, Art from the 1100s or something. A blessing means, it means a joy, an overflowing joy, a contentment, a satisfaction, a happiness. Happy, how happy are those who've not seen and yet believed. Now, many times I think people think that those who saw are more blessed than those who didn't see. I know that I thought that. Reading the Bible, I think, man, I wish I was there on that day. I wish I would have been there to see the emotion when Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus. And that interaction between Jesus and Martha and Jesus and Mary and the, this, the, the pathos of that scene and, and that, the, the look on his face. I wish I could have been there and seen the look on his face when, when the rooster crowed and Peter denied Jesus the third time and then it says, Jesus looked at Peter. Man, I wish that somehow I could have a, a snapshot of that Instagram. Hashtag rooster. Hashtag denial. Hashtag in the Bible forever. <laughs> what was the look on Jesus' face? I don't think it was condemnation. I think it was love. Jesus told him what was going to happen. It's not like he didn't look at him disappointed. He knew it was going to happen. I think it was a look of, of acceptance. It was a look of, I'm still for you. I still love you. Because Peter went out and wept. He went out and wept. And he came back. Jesus restored him. So you look at some of those things and you think, man, I wish I would have been able to see. Jesus says, you're more blessed having believed and never seen. You have, a, you, have a, you have an opportunity for a greater experience than they had having seen. You've never seen. You have a chance for a better experience. Isn't that interesting? That's why these beatitudes are given to us because they're kind of opposite of what the world says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, hey, the poor in spirit, no way. <laughs> who wants to be poor in spirit? Poor in spirit, like, well, that's sorrowful. Blessed are those who mourn. Oh, I don't want to be mourning. I want to be rejoicing. No, rejoice. Happy are those who are persecuted. Rejoice when you're persecuted and suffer for my name's sake. Wait, these beatitudes kind of throw the wisdom of the world upside down. So here's this thing. I wish I could have seen. If I would have seen, that's better. And Jesus said, actually... Actually, it's better for you if you never saw and you still believed. That's interesting. What is this blessing that Jesus is talking about? Here's number one. I think that it means more to God. And that's why I put it as number one. It means more to God. It means more to God when you say, Lord, I never seen, but I know you. And I know that if you said it, it's going to happen. I believe you. That means a lot. Think of it just in a human way between you and somebody else. You know, uh, let's say you call your buddy up and say, hey, uh, I need to put some tack welds on uh, this part I'm working on on the frame, and, you know, can I borrow your welder? 
And the guy says, oh, yeah, sure. And you're like, well, I, you know, he's, I need it next week, though. Okay, I'll bring it back by Wednesday. The guy's like, great, I totally trust you. I'd like a $1,000 deposit. <laughs> you go, wait, what? Yeah, man, $1,000 deposit. Well, no, I said I'd bring it back. I know. I, mean, I trust you totally, man. You and I are like, we're bonded, dude. 1000 bucks though. Oh, well, come on. Right? But if you have a relationship with someone, they go, look, you, it's fine. If you said it, it's fine. It honors the person who's made the statement. When somebody implicitly, sim- simply believes in what somebody else says because of their character, because of who they are, it honors that person. It brings honor to God. And not only does it bring honor to God, it pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, you guys know the verse. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So not only does it bring God honor, but it also brings God pleasure. Now here's an interesting theological conundrum. How do you bring God pleasure? Isn't God, God by himself, he's pleased. He's a happy God, you could say. He's self satisfy that it's part of the definition of who god is that we have in the scripture god doesn't need to make the creation to make himself satisfied the father the son the spirit the three in one there's perfect perfect contentment perfection beauty everything that's needed for perfection is there within who god is so how can you say you bring him pleasure he has he is and yet here's what the bible says In our free will, when we exercise our own free will and we say without coercement, without coercion, without being forced, without being manipulated, we say, you know what? You're real and I believe in you and everything you said is true and I'm going to count on you 100%. And that pleases the heart of God. You were made to bring pleasure to God. And what so many people are missing when they're living in this world and wondering, I just keep trying to find it, and I can't find it. Listen, you're not pleasing God. (laughs) The thing that you need that your heart craves is the personal relationship with God where you're pleasing God. And when you're pleasing God, you're pleased. When you're pleasing God, and you're honoring God, and you're bringing Him pleasure, then you found the reason why you're living. The money won't do it. The pleasures won't do it. The adrenaline rush won't do it. Whatever it is that people chase in this life thinking that that's going to be it, it's not it. It will never be it. You were made for God. Your heart was made to be his home. And when you believe him, it pleases him. And that pleasure, it's your life. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I mean, you can kill me. (laughs) And I'll, I'll be more alive than I ever was. And my life in in this life is all about Jesus. I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a faith that honors God. It's a faith that pleases God. That's this blessing Jesus is talking about. And because it means more to God than it means more to us. It's interesting, we've... Think like Thomas, and the natural mind says, well, if I see, then I'll believe. The Bible says, actually, if you believe, then you'll see. It's really interesting. The world is just, our natural way of thinking is just so backwards. We just really don't understand the spiritual realities. But actually, a blessing comes by believing, because when you believe, you see things. When you believe, you start to see the world differently. You start to participate in the miracles of God, the glory of God. Believing leads to seeing. That's part of the blessing. In John 11, verse 40, at the, the grave of Lazarus, when he, Jesus says, roll away the stone, and, and remember the sister says, he's been dead four days. He's decomposing. Remember the Jewish people, when they would wrap the bodies, they would put spices. Why would they put the fragrant spices? So they could come back tomorrow. And they'd come back with more spices. Why would they come back with more spices? So they could come back the next day. But then you don't keep coming back because you don't want to associate that smell with that person. The smell of what? The smell of death. Decomposition. As the body is turning back into dust from 
whence it came. And it's been four days that Lazarus is dead, and Jesus says, roll away the stone, and she says, no. And what did Jesus say? It's John 11, verse 40. Didn't I say to you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? Let me repeat it. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. The blessing for those who have not seen and yet believe is that believing, they'll see the glory of God. Now Thomas had an opportunity to be in that group and Thomas was in his own struggle and God bless him for taking one for the team. Like Peter, who's known forever as denying the Lord three times and yet being so wonderfully redeemed, Thomas is this wonderful skeptic. You'll meet him in heaven and you'll go, yeah, yeah, that's me. I did it. Yeah, it's true. I was, yeah, that was me. Yeah, but you know, I was a believer though a week later, so I, you know, uh, yeah, so really you did that? Yeah, I did. I said that, yeah. He took one for the team. I mean, we're encouraged by his his skepticism that Jesus condescended to him. Jesus revealed himself to him. Jesus drew him. Jesus saved him. But the lesson for us, because we're in the group that has never seen and yet believed, and here's a blessing for you. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. There's a story in John chapter 1 in the life of Jesus when his first disciples were coming. John chapter 1, starting in verse 45, the calling of Nathanael. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. The, the, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. There's a lot to that passage. We don't have time to really um, you know, dive into it and get everything out of it that's there. There's a reference here, this ladder between heaven and earth. This is a reference back to uh, one of the patriarchs, Jacob, when he was leaving and he laid down and he just, on his own, he just had the clothes on his back and he laid down with a rock as his pillow and he had a vision of a ladder between heaven and earth and he saw the angels of God connected. Heaven connected to earth and the blessing of heaven coming to earth and the need of earth rising to heaven and this exchange between heaven and earth. And Jesus is saying, I'm that. I'm the connection. The blessing of heaven is going to come to earth and it's because of me. And the cry of earth and the pain of earth and the, and, and the sin the, the, the brokenness of earth, earth can be re, 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 redeemed, it can be bought back, it can be rescued, and you'll see the things of earth climbing to heaven, you'll see things from heaven coming down. You're going to see that. Because I told you this thing that I saw you before you, were under the, before you called you under the fig tree, you're going to see greater things. Like what? You're going to see the things of heaven coming into people's lives. Listen, the believers know that. Am I right? The believers know that. The blessing of believing and never seeing is that somebody who's got tremendous need on earth, you can take it right to heaven. There's a, there's a ladder. Jesus is the, the connection. And you believed in Jesus, and you think, man, this, this is a perfect place for Jesus. These people need Jesus. This family needs Jesus. This person, this, they need the Lord, and they're broken. This is an op- their heart is open. And you take the thing from earth, and you take it to heaven, and then the blessing from heaven, it comes down, doesn't it? And it'll change people's lives. And you get to see it. You get to see it with your own eyes. You believed and then you saw the glory of God. Just like Jesus said. I just want to encourage you in that. As you think about Easter, every single one of us as believers, we're in the, we're, we have the blessing Jesus was talking about this Easter. The blessing of believing in the resurrection without seeing. I never saw his nail prints. I never saw the whole in his side. I'm amazed that Jesus would say to this guy, well, go ahead and, I mean, my enemy put a spear up there. My friend can put his hand in. If you're doubting today, though, if maybe you don't know that blessing of believing and you're doubting, then let me just suggest to you to do the same thing that Thomas did. It's very significant. 
Thomas said, I'll believe if I can see the wounds. If you're a doubter today, look at the wounds of Jesus. Think about how they took a crown of thorns and they beat it down into his head. Why is Jesus wearing a crown of thorns of all things? He's crowned with a crown and it's a crown of thorns. Doesn't that take you back to the Garden of Eden and the curse of sin? And what does God say about the ground? The ground is going to be cursed and what's it going to bring forth? Apparently, the roses were awesome in the garden. There weren't thorns. And it's interesting about the, the thorn. Just a little interesting thing about the rose is everywhere there's a thorn, there, it's, it's basically the same structure on the inside. It should be producing a branch. <laughs> it could be, but instead of, it's a thorn. It's really fascinating. A crown of thorns. And Jesus is wearing that crown of thorns. If you're a doubter, look at that crown and think, why would Jesus be crowned with a crown of thorns? Look at the holes in his hands. Why would Jesus be nailed to a cross? The hole in his feet, he's suspended. He's hanging in the air. He's crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And look at those wounds and think, Jesus was forsaken by God that I would never be forsaken by God. Jesus became a guilt offering and a sin offering that I would be saved from my sins. And the hole in his side, that was after his death. The Passover was coming. The sun was about to set. The day would begin at sunset for the Jew. And the next day, I mean, not the Passover, the day after the Passover, which was a holy Sabbath day, they didn't, they didn't want the bodies on the cross on that day. And so they came to break their legs and they saw Jesus was already not breathing. And so to confirm that he was dead, the hole in his side is the confirmation of his death. And they took a spear and they pierced it up into his side and blood and water came flowing out. His heart had burst. You could say he died of a broken heart. <laughs> what happened to that heart? What happened to it as the weight of sin was upon it? And Jesus said the words, it is finished, and he dismissed his spirit. And when he was dead, they pierced his side and blood and water came out. And look at that hole. Think of those wounds of Jesus. If you're a doubter, think of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Is that enough? Is that enough for you? And think of the reality that he rose from the dead the third day. Think of the evidence and the proof, the validity, the veracity of his resurrection in the changed lives that you see before you. That he could change a person from being a liar to being a person who tells the truth, from being angry to being loving, from being bitter to being merciful, from being ugly to being beautiful. He does. The power of the resurrection. Consider his death for you, his wounds. Consider his blood that was shed for you, his life that was poured out. And open your heart to, for, to receive that forgiveness and that cleansing. Christianity is about Jesus, not about us. Hey, if your experience with humanity has made you skeptical, you need to meet Jesus. Meet Jesus. Ask him. Find out if he's trustworthy. Let him into your heart. Surrender your life to him. See what he does with it. I think you'll find that he's not like any person you've ever known. He's unlike any person you've ever met. Open your heart to receive forgiveness and cleansing from Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for how you speak to us. And we ask you, Lord, right now to encourage, Lord, the believers. We just thank you for this wonderful beatitude. And that blessed are those who have never seen and yet have believed. And we have a room full of people who have that blessing. So, Lord, stir up our hearts to that blessing. Stir up our hearts to... Uh, receive the, the, the joy, the contentment, the satisfaction, the happiness that comes from bringing you honor, bringing you pleasure as we believe in what you said. And Lord, that we would see the glory of God. That seeing is, is believing in one sense, but for the believer, it's the other way around. Believing is seeing. Lord, that having believed, we would see that we would see, Lord, the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That we would see, Lord, you depositing the blessings of heaven into people's lives. 
people who are broken, they would become whole, and people who are, who, who are uh, grieving would be filled with the joy of the Lord. People with no hope of the future would have a hope for their future. Lord, would you please uh, fill us with that blessing of believing? And then, Lord, also, if there's anybody here who needs to respond to you, Lord, on this resurrection celebration day, that reminder that you were, you were pierced for our transgressions, wounded for our sins, and the, the Lord laid upon you the iniquity of us all. And while all of us like sheep had gone astray, Lord, you, you came to be the Savior, the good shepherd who brings back his sheep. So if there's any stray sheep, Lord, that are listening, that you'd bring them back, that this would be the time when they would say, I, I've considered your wounds and I, I'm done living away from you. I'm done going my own way. I'm done with this garbage, like the prodigal son, just beginning to <laughs> want to eat what the pigs were eating and then coming to his senses, Lord, that you would help if there's anybody here who needs to come to their senses and turn away from sin, that this would be their moment to do that. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer of responding in faith to what Jesus has said. You want the, the blessing to come for being a believer. You're believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you're ready to surrender your life to him. And pray this prayer with me. I'll, I'll say the phrases. You repeat them and mean them from your heart, and Jesus will hear you. And as you mean it from your heart, he'll answer, and he'll make you a new person. So say, Jesus, please forgive me for all my sins. And I ask you to come into my heart right now and be the Lord of my life. I surrender everything to you. I give up all my false gods and my idols. And I only want one God, and that's you. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you. I believe in you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing prayers like that, simple prayers. Thank you for the prayer of the thief on the cross. It was even simpler than that, and you heard that prayer and answered it. Lord, we pray that you would make that new birth a reality for anybody who prayed that, that they would become a new creation in Christ. The old things truly would pass away, and all things would become new. And we pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be poured out on them as they asked, and that you would be the Lord of their life. So thank you, God, for giving us the right to become the children of God when we believe in your name. So give that power, Lord, as you've opened that door. And Father, we thank you. Thank you for raising your son from the dead. Jesus, thank you for raising yourself from the dead. As you said, no one takes your life. You have power to lay it down. You have power to take it again. So we bless you for this day, this in our calendar, our annual remembrance or our weekly remembrance every first day of the week when we gather. Lord, that you conquered the grave. You rose from the dead. You're a worthy God, a worthy Savior, a real God and a real Savior. We bless you and we thank you so much for coming and, and saving us. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen.